welcome to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. My name is Karen Riddell, and today I'm delighted to have with me Dr. Earl Ellis, who's an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems here at UMBC. Hi, Earl. Thank you, Karen. I'd like you to uh, start and tell me a little bit about your research and how you got to where you are today. All right, well, I guess I should start with what I do now, which is really looking at how humans are changing the planet from a point of view of land use in the biosphere. Uh, and I really didn't start off with that kind of, a, of an outlook. I was actually began my career as a plant biologist, and I worked in the Good basement of a building studying how things moved around inside of plants. Um, so I've come a long way, and, and it really went first through a process of realizing that plant biology wasn't going to do the kinds of things that I wanted to do, which was to improve agricultural productivity. That was my original interest. Um, and I got the feeling like really the problem wasn't food production from plants, it was really the way farming systems work. And then I got interested in sustainable agriculture. And then finally that led to an interest in China where they had had agriculture that had been productive for so many thousands of years. I thought this is where we can learn about sustainable agriculture and sustainable ecosystems. Hmm. So I spent a couple of years there uh, First as an English teacher, actually, just learning how things work in China. Hmm. And later as an NSF postdoctoral fellow, studying how the nitrogen cycle worked in Chinese villages and how it had changed from a traditional system that was very nitrogen limited. They didn't have enough fertilizer to keep things productive. Uh, and how they've kind of gone all the way in the other direction by adding so much fertilizer that it's coming out the other end. <laughs> and that led to my interest in global change, where you look at how people using the land in China is changing the atmosphere of the planet. It's, it's contributing to the thinning of the ozone layer. Just this hand application of fertilizer in China done by hundreds of millions of farmers is actually a global change process. It's amazing. So that's how I ended up with land use and global change. Um, and I could tell some more about the different kinds of projects that are going along with that right now. Yeah, why don't you uh, start on either end, either China or uh, what you're working on right now? So my results from China, I had a, a few different projects there. The first project, uh, we really, like I said, looked at the nitrogen cycle. And I think the main thing that we found is something that really seems obvious to all of us now, but at the time wasn't so obvious, which was that the transition to the more industrial forms of agriculture had led to this incredibly heavy use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers mm -hmm. and other chemicals as well, and that that was a globally significant process. So that was that, was that earlier work. Um, then in a later project where I received additional funds to do a, a study across China. That first study was done really just in a few villages in one region of Jiangsu province in China. Uh, we went to a, a project across China, five different research sites. It was really, I would have to say, kind of an overambitious project where we had field research going on all the way across China, north, south, east, west, and center, um, with five graduate students working over there, looking at how not just nitrogen, but also carbon and phosphorus have changed as farmers transition from that kind of traditional sustainable system to the new systems that they have now. Mm -hmm. um, and from that study, we found some things that we really didn't expect. One, one thing that we found that was kind of interesting was that uh, at first, not seeming so interesting, that people have built a lot of houses in the countryside. That's not really a surprise. We have about a, twice the population there. The surprising thing is when you add it all up, and it turns out if you add up the area of all the built structures in the rural areas of China, mm -hmm. it's four times greater than the entire area of all of China's cities put together. No, really? Just the change in the last 60 years is greater than the entire area of all of China's cities today. Wow, that's really amazing. So if you're interested in development going on in China, most people tend to think of the cities. Mm -hmm. And of course, the cities are incredibly dynamic and growing fast and, and huge and a global process in themselves. But the countryside is actually the big story in China. Hmm. That's where most people still live. And that's where they actually sprawl over really relatively large areas because in the countryside you can build a bigger house and mm -hmm. this sort of thing. So that was one interesting thing. Uh, the other surprising result was that what would you expect to see if you were looking at trees in an environment where people are basically eking out a living with agriculture and they've gone from one population to a doubled population. Would you expect more or less trees in that environment? A lot less trees. That was my expectation, a lot less trees. I was just going to measure this. We found the opposite was true, that actually hmm. there was about 10, the, the landscape had about 10% more tree cover, a 10% increase overall in the landscape in terms of tree cover around hmm. the totality of the rural, densely populated rural China uh, during that period. So tree cover increased while agricultural productivity increased hmm. and population increased all at the same time. And that hmm. seems like these things should be opposing each other. 
we found basically what you see in a lot of developed countries, what we call the forced transition, that uh, wealthier people actually will not use the worst land. They'll let that basically lie fallow. And there's other developments as well that cause this. One is uh, the development of orchards. Mm -hmm. Orchards were never a significant type of land use in the, in the past, and now they're very significant in China. And another odd one that kind of is surprising is when people build houses, either they plant trees or they let trees grow up. And so increases hmm. in housing cause significant increases in tree cover. Hmm. So even though these wouldn't properly be called forests, the net increase across this area of China is equivalent over this period of 60 years to about three years of tropical deforestation. That's how much tree cover wow. we're talking about. So our, we're talking about 60 years and three years, mm -hmm. but clearly this is another globally significant process mm -hmm. that is completely missed by the way we observe the Earth at the kind of course of resolutions that we do. Um, for, from far away from satellites. When you get up close there, you can find these amazing changes mm -hmm. going on that are really not visible in, from far away. In the increase in tree cover, did that was that roughly um, equal between those three sorts of categories that you came up with? So people planting trees um, by houses, ah. increase in orchards, or, or was one more predominant than the other, or don't you know, like didn't, did you not get the data to be able well, to Well, it's hard to summarize in detail. There are five sites, and what we found is in every site, you have a different transition. Yeah. So in, in, for example, the deep tropics, the big effect was actually orchards and abandonment of, of agricultural land. That was a, mm -hmm. a big reason, abandonment of agricultural land. And the North China Plain, which is a little bit more like Colorado, mm -hmm. where trees don't really grow so easily by themselves, they need water. Mm -hmm. The big increase in tree cover is a combination of built up areas around houses, because there mm -hmm. are housing areas increased dramatically, um, and more trees there, um, and orchards. Um, an area like Jiangsu province, kind of in between, you know, it's a m little bit more tropical, mostly orchards there um, and housing. I guess that's, that's similar to the North China Plain. So every, every region has a different story, hmm. but the story is this adds up to the same thing everywhere, mm -hmm. a net increase wow. in the cover by closed canopy trees. Mm -hmm. So take home messages from that overall project. So, ah. you know, are you continuing on with yeah, it? And or? It, yeah, and it really inspired the next phase of, of my work, um, which was local people have global effects that you can't observe globally without looking locally. And so <laughs> that led to this idea that in order to understand the ecology of the planet as it's been transformed by people, we need to understand these local processes as well as we understand the global processes. <laughs> um, and so that led to an interest in looking at these global patterns that people have created. Um, the tendency with ecologists is to look at the planet as this place created by wild or kind of natural forces outside of human control that's the, that's the planet. And then you have people kind of disturbing it, cutting away at it, changing the planet in this kind of negative way. Mm -hmm. So you have the natural earth and humans disturbing it. That's, that's ecology. Now, I don't see it that way at all, especially you know, working in China where these places that I worked in were thousands of years of human activity and people had survived there for thousands of years. And things were a little bit desperate in the, in the old days, but nevertheless, it was a sustained human act interaction. And mm -hmm. they didn't just destroy things, they created things. Mm -hmm. The soils there are different than anything that was existing without people because mm -hmm. of the use of, of flooding and rice paddy agriculture and a lot of other activities. They changed the ecology of those systems in ways that really are, they're creative, they're not just destructive. And if you look globally, right, is Manhattan just destruction? Manhattan is a creation as well. So looking at the earth we've created, the, the planet, the biosphere that we've created, that was, that was my interest, mm -hmm. to, to look at the richness mm -hmm. of human interaction with ecosystems rather than just kind of the, the casualty of the, the wild being replaced by the destroyed human areas. Mm -hmm. So that led to this idea of anthropogenic biomes. Yeah, tell me about that. So I think most people are familiar with the concept of biomes, if not the term. Mm -hmm. And for example, when I say the term tropical rainforest, okay, that's a biome, a desert, grassland. These are the global ecological patterns that are created primarily by climate and evolution over a long period of time. That's, that's, that's the biosphere as it's taught in the classroom um, at every level. You mm -hmm. see it in third grade. Um, anthropogenic biomes is the idea that we have created globally significant ecological patterns and that these can be observed as well. Mm -hmm. And so my goal with that initial work was merely to just categorize this. You know, what are these big globally significant ecological patterns created by people? And some things are obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Cities urban areas. That's a kind of an obvious one. Nobody is surprised by that. And people, of course, will talk about agriculture, agricultural lands as being this kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, we also, though, looked at the relationship between population densities and the form of agriculture that you would see in a place. And, of course, the differences are tremendous, right? The agriculture of the Great Plains of the United States 
compared with the agriculture of rural China and some of the densely populated areas where you have population densities far greater than our suburbs mm -hmm. are all surviving on the food that they produce. Com completely different places, but they're both agricultural. Mm -hmm. So using that uh, information that we could get on global patterns of population and, and land use, mm -hmm. we developed a set of, of 19 anthropogenic biomes that range from these urban and densely settled areas all the way to wildlands. Within between we have uh, villages, mm -hmm. which are these densely populated agricultural ecosystems, and then uh, croplands, mm -hmm. rangelands, and uh, what we call now semi-natural lands. These are lands that are not used very intensively, but do have permanent human settlements and some significant use of land, and clearly have been modified by people. They, For example, the forests in those areas could have all been cut and regrown, mm -hmm. or even they could be an oil palm plantation. We're not necessarily sure, but they don't show up in for example, agricultural statistics is being fully mm. used. So we have this, this very wide range mm -hmm. of, uh, of ecosystems created by people. And then all um, wildlands are all categorized kind of into one big, just wildlands are, are you know, further subcategorized or is it just all one big lump? Um, well, actually, because we were focusing primarily on what the human created mm -hmm. patterns were like, uh, we didn't make a big effort to focus on the okay, details, but we, we, didn't just, we didn't just use one category, though. Oh, okay. Uh, we did it two different ways. Uh, in one case, we had three categories, which was basically forest covered, uh, sparsely vegetated, or somewhere in between, and then mo mostly barren. Mm -hmm. And then in the second, the second way we did it was just uh, mostly forested and mm -hmm. grasslands and others, that, okay. that sort of areas. Um, but we also, and actually that's part of the work we just got uh, accepted for publication, is looking at, uh, not only looking at the history of these changes, but also looking deeply at how each of these classic biomes, the biomes that were created not by people, but by natural processes, how each of these has a different pathway as humans have come to transform them. So mm. we've divided up the world both ways mm -hmm. and looked at the trajectories of human use and conversion into anthropogenic biomes in each different biome. So for mm. example, what happened to tropical forests anyway? Mm -hmm. And of course you find, you know, there's really not that much tropical forest that's wild anymore. And in fact, there really wasn't in 1700. Mm -hmm. It wasn't heavily used back then, but there were people living all through most tropical forests in 1700. It's not mm -hmm. like we recently showed up and created this anthropogenic world. It's been a long, long process over thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And even though the intensity of our use has really changed dramatically mm -hmm. in the last couple hundred years, uh, the extent of our use really is nothing new. We've been using mm -hmm. most of the earth uh, in some way, in relatively restrained ways, for a long, long time. And is this um, is there controversy to this? Does I mean, is this this seems like it makes total sense to me? Are people out there in agreement? Do they like this idea? Um, well, there's there's different sides of it, and mm -hmm. and uh, we actually looked at one aspect of this uh, with a professor named Bill Ruddeman, who's famous for his anthrop early anthropogenic hypothesis, which holds that some trends in the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years since the last glaciation, that trends in the greenhouse gases of that period, which would normally be expected to decline and decline and decline until we reach another glacial period. In our period, we actually have a decline and then it goes back up. Now, not a very big increase, but thousands of years ago, you do see a change in the trend from what you'd normally see a decline to an increase, gradual increase, um, that that's caused by early human use of land for agriculture. And that has caused some significant controversy over mm -hmm. the years, um, and it remains controversial. Mm -hmm. But uh, some work we recently did together shows that it's completely plausible that the small number of people that were actually present back, you know, 5,000, 7,000 years ago were actually capable of clearing and burning large areas of land because of the way that they farmed. Hmm. They farmed in these more shifting agriculture patterns that enabled them to really use a lot of land with very little labor. Mm -hmm. That was the key. They weren't trying to uh, use land efficiently because they had as much land as they could possibly want. So they just mm -hmm. tried to do a low labor type of farming. So that's somewhat controversial. Mm -hmm. um, and the first time I actually presented work on this concept of anthropogenic biomes was in the UC, University of California Santa Cruz Environmental Studies Department, which is a very uh, conservation oriented department. And there was some feeling, I think, that they weren't sure that they wanted this message to get through to their students because mm -hmm. the traditional values of nature conservation have been the more wild it is, the more valuable it is. And that by invoking the value, of the, the wildness of a place, you could say we must protect it because it is wild. And here comes this professor talking about, you know, there's really very little wild place 
anywhere. It's not as wild as you thought it was. They, they see huh. this as kind of giving the impetus to those who would use the land for, for parking lots or something like that. And I think there's, there's a reasonable uh, fear there because I think a lot of people do value nature only in that way. The wilder it is, the more valuable it is. If you, if you say it's not wild, it's less valuable somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's part of the problem is that set of values in this century needs to change. It needs to, it needs, mm. We need to go to a post-natural environmentalism where we're not valuing nature just because it's wild. We're valuing nature because we love it. Mm -hmm. We value nature because it's good for us to value nature. It's not about this wild value outside of us. It's our wild values our, or our nature values that mm -hmm. really matter. And wildness really isn't the, the number one uh, reason that we should value nature. Mm -hmm. And I think ecosystem services, this concept that uh, nature or ecosystems that we're not necessarily managing directly may produce a lot of value for us in society. And even, it could be even economically valued and mm -hmm. maybe should be if we want to sustainably manage those kind of resources. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of controversy there, but I think most, on the most part, people have embraced it. Even they, I think, uh, felt that, you know, they couldn't deny the reality. It was just a matter of whether that message was going to be the best message if your goal is to move toward a more, uh, environmentally sustainable society, mm -hmm. you know, whether you want that to be the message that there's right. no wild places left. Mm. Or maybe how to package the message, maybe. Yeah. So what, um, are, you know, what are your future plans with um, this work with anthropogenic biomes? Or you know, do you have uh, newer projects that have stemmed off of this that um, you're interested, you know, you want to talk about? Sure. I mean, I, I think that uh, I already kind of talked a little bit about some of the more recent stuff, which is looking at the historical changes. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of is as taps out that, that line of research because all we're doing is describing patterns that you can see. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, we can describe and describe. We actually want to do a, a study going back through the whole Holocene to look at the emergence of, of humans really onto the scene as a large-scale phenomenon. But that's, again, it's just description of what we can observe. Mm -hmm. But we want to go to a much richer view, uh, kind of a more uh, theoretical view of how humans change the planet, how humans use different places differently. Um, and that requires a whole different approach. Rather than just looking at something like how much land is used for crops at any particular time, we want to figure out why there's that much land used for crops and be able to predict that amount of crops based on the environmental constraints of a place. So knowing you know, when people come to a place and they have these resources, what will they do? How will they use it? Hmm. Um, and what are the forces acting on people in those situations? And obviously some of these things are things like economics, mm -hmm. right? If you're coming to a place that's got a forest and you're very wealthy, you might just want to go hiking. And if you are a person who doesn't have any food and no other resources than an ax, you're probably gonna cut down some forest and grow some food. Mm -hmm. And so economic access, uh, the spatial patterns created by human political boundaries are significant. So trying to really come up with a model, just like climate models can predict the natural patterns of biodiversity and biomes, mm -hmm. these global patterns of ecology, can we come up with a human climate? The human processes that really have, are structuring the biosphere. Because if we can do that, not only can we better understand why things happen and the cause and effect of what's happening, we can <laughs> forecast. We can say if these tre trends, for example, economics go in this direction and development goes in this direction, what are people going to be doing in different parts of the earth at different times? And that, of course, gives you the chance to, to manage better mm -hmm. because Maybe you can policy. evaluate the future in a more realistic way and see what, what are the effects of, of what we do. So that, that's a, I would say that's probably the most important thing that we need to do with this concept is make it as useful as the biome concept is. Mm -hmm. The classic biome concept is really useful because climate predicts the patterns. So you've got a cause and effect relationship. So far we've just described the, the surface mm -hmm. and we want to get into that cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a big, a big effort. A couple other things we're working on. Um, another one is uh, a project that is on a completely different scale, but is something that actually is very close to my roots as a landscape ecologist. My work in China really was looking at how landscapes have changed there at the scale at which humans manage the landscape. Mm -hmm. We often think of land changes and like deforestation or urbanization as these huge processes that go on over very large extents. But as I've shown in China, that housing change, for example, most cases, except in one of the regions, the housing is all very dispersed. It's invisible from most remote sensing by satellites. You can't see it. The houses are too dispersed and they're often covered by trees. Hmm. You can't see all this development. A huge amount of Earth's surface is in that category of 
very fine scale changes going on as a result of ongoing human activity. So techniques for measuring this are really challenging. And there is some very interesting work now with what's called LIDAR, uh, which is a laser scanning system mounted on an aircraft because it's very heavy. Mm -hmm. The equipment needed to make this, not actually the laser scanner, but some of the equipment used to measure positions of the laser, very heavy. It's mounted on a commercial aircraft, and you can do three-dimensional scans of ecosystems. And for example, you can even see which species are growing underneath trees, mm -hmm. like on the forest floor, th right through the trees using these kinds of scanning methods. So you can measure very precisely things like how much carbon is in the vegetation, or even the biodiversity of vegetation is being able to be measured now by using these scanning systems. And when I was at my sabbatical again at, uh, at uh, Stanford, I, came, I was actually working right next to someone who's got pretty much the cutting edge device for this work, a laser scanner coupled with this other advanced uh, multispectral and even hyperspectral uh, scanning system for vegetation and did a lot of the cutting edge work. I wanted one of these. <laughs> I wanted one of these for my projects. I got you know real you know instrument envy. I wanted that instrument, but the problem is not just that it's really expensive. It costs half a million dollars. And a plane. And a plane. Yeah, and a pilots. And it, and it, and even even more important in some ways is that it turned out that this technology, at least he was using at the time, was so advanced that it was not allowed to fly out of United States territory. Now that has since changed. He's now permitted to fly in in a few countries, but it's not something I'm ever going to fly in China. It's not something I'm ever going to be able to fly any in a lot of the places I'm interested in working, where most people live, mm -hmm. in India. You know, that's where most people live, India and China. So I wanted a sensor that I could use, mm -hmm. do something similar, but not requiring this logistical nightmare of flying this, this basically the spy-grade remote sensing platform <laughs> into some developing country. And it turned out that a couple things, actually three things came together to make that possible. In theory, mm -hmm. that, and we've been fooling around with it, and we're, we're hoping to get some funds to develop it into actually a technique as, as advanced in some ways as, as that other technique, um, which is a very lightweight, uh, hobbyist-grade, radio-controlled aircraft. Mm -hmm. It's no problem now to go down to your toy store. Or, well, maybe a little bit better than that. But for $500, you can buy a little helicopter that can carry a nice, high-quality digital camera Mm -hmm. And that's all very nice. You get some nice pictures. But then it turns out there's another really cool thing going on. And if you want to check it out on the web, it's called Photosynth is, is the example that you can see on the web, just like photosynthesis without the assist at the end. <laughs> um, it's a technique that actually can synthesize multiple photos with no more data than just the photos. It finds the same object in patches across the different photos. And from the matching of pieces of the photos, it generates a three-dimensional geometry from the photos and then can actually generate a three-dimensional geometry of these little points, just like a laser scan, except with color. And if you do that with enough different camera angles, you can actually build a three-dimensional reconstruction, we've actually shown this already, of vegetation and buildings and all these things that is on the order of accuracy and, and, and depth of information that you get from these fancy uh, devices that cost half a million dollars. So you can get your three-dimensional forest canopy or under canopy or the forest floor of vegetation. That's our goal. Right now we're getting kind of the surface and some of the inside, but uh, we're pretty confident by combining a few ground observations with some of these these uh, photos taken from the air, we're going to mm -hmm. get to the point where we can get something very similar to that product. It's not going to be quite as good, but when you consider, we call this the poor man's LIDAR in some ways, when you consider what you can do for so little, we, we mm -hmm. our goal is for this to cost $1,000 and fit into a suitcase that you can take on the airlines. Mm -hmm. And we'll, if you take this thing out, we'll not scare anybody with thinking that this is the kind of object that the police should get involved in. Or if, even if they do, they're gonna see it. it's a toy airplane with a regular camera attached to it. Um, and even if they wanted to take it, it wouldn't be a problem. So we could use this thing anywhere, mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, it's only gonna fly in a small area, so we're gonna sample different areas of the world. But from this, I think the ultimate goal is to have a tool to look at the Earth we've created up close and personal mm -hmm. from a global point of view, um, you know, using these kinds of, of kind of cheap mm -hmm. systems. And in fact, it can even be done in a very distributed way with maybe even hobbyists in different countries using this kind of technology. So we're kind of excited about sharing. that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, really, if you just have a high school hobbyist and some cameras and software that you can download for free, mm -hmm. you can do this work. It's kind of a remarkable thing. It's very rare that you get access hmm. to this kind of technology so cheaply. How else do you see this um, being, assuming it comes into play, um, how else do you see this being utilized by other scientists, other ecologists, other people? Well, the applications are huge. Okay. I mean, we're looking at it from a purely ecological science point of view. We mm -hmm. want to make sure ecologists get this thing available to them. 
um, because I think they're going to be left out more than other groups. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, one of the groups that we're working with in developing this is the U.S. Forest Service, and they're interested in it from the point of view of fire. And not just from the point of view of, of fire mapping, hazard mapping, which has a lot to do with how vegetation is placed near buildings. Mm -hmm. It really makes a difference whether it's 10 feet away or it's 3 feet away. It's the okay. difference maybe between the house going or not. And so doing the fire mapping or fire potential mapping mm -hmm. in very quickly is an important thing for first responders. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you could just show up there with a suitcase, maybe even on the fire truck, and go out and, and do your three-dimensional mapping right there on site, mm -hmm. that's a tremendous application. But you can imagine, of course, real estate. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways you could see this kind of application coming into kind of the commercial arena. Mm -hmm. um, there are actually scientists already using this technology uh, for mapping in archaeology, and mm -hmm. you're also seeing it in uh, some terrain mapping applications, but usually at very small scales with cameras mounted on tripods. I think hmm. we're the first to, to be using it in this way. Aerially right? and looking down. Yeah, although we, actually there's others who have used it aerially, but they've only tried to reconstruct uh, services. They're not mm -hmm. trying to do the 3D reconstruction. That's the part that we're putting into it. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's pretty interesting. Any um, future other projects? Anything that you know that you're really excited about? Um, well, I've got one other one other project that's truly in the works. It's something that hasn't been proposed yet, but it, we're putting it together gradually with a with the group of people all over the world, um, which is to develop what we call a global land collaboration engine, which hopefully will bring to help bring together. Uh, scientists who do the normal bread and butter work of land change science. So if you're trying to look at land use change and why it occurs, you're almost inevitably doing a case study. Mm -hmm. you're, in a, you're in a local place and you're interviewing the people who are doing the land changes and trying to figure out, you know, why do they cut down this forest here and, and in this one they leave it? You know, what are the real causes of, of this kind of thing? Um, that's a case study approach. But from the point of view, as I just mentioned, of, of global change, this is global change. But the global change scientists really are generally unable to bring that kind of information into their work. It's too detailed, it's too local, and it's too hard to figure out how it all fits together in the global scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And so what this is, is a technical solution of sorts that allows us to, using statistical methods and uh, geographic methods, determine how representative any place of the Earth is with any other um, based on some variables that you're interested in. So you Let's wanted to know, further. let's say for example, you wanted to know uh, what other areas are like this area that you're doing your case study in. How many other areas are like that in terms of population density, forest cover, economics, uh, say for example, the gross domestic product of that area, or uh, you know some other kind of characteristic. So you choose mm -hmm. these variables or terrain, say mm -hmm. how flat they are. You could choose that and you could instantly have a map and statistics showing you where you fit in the spectrum of this globally. globally. Huh. Right, instantly. That's a key part of this. We can already do this very slowly with anal analytical techniques. It's very possible to do. Mm -hmm. But each time you do it, it's a big job mm -hmm. and it takes a long time. The idea is to d develop a back engine, uh, com computational back engine that can do this kind of work very quickly, mm -hmm. almost transparently, so that it's a little like Google Earth, right? Google Earth has huge amounts of data and processing going on but you never notice it, right? It's almost instant to you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, all of a sudden, working with remote sense data that you know, in the past was a really big job for experts is now something you do, anyone can do for free in an internet cafe, right? It's no big deal to do, look mm -hmm. at Google Earth and zoom into the planet. That used to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. Same idea for this, except more for the scientists who are trying to figure out what are these globally influencing processes and how are they inspired locally. It also allows you to lay out kind of on a spectrum the different types of systems that you see globally. So you could say, how does population density influence what people will do? And you can look at all the case studies, thousands of case studies, for example, that we have mm -hmm. or are doing. Um, how do they all tell us? What do they tell us about what people will do mm -hmm. if population changes again, for example? So it enables us to synthesize things as well. So you can work together. You can find who else is doing similar work and mm -hmm. work with them more and learn from them. But you could also take what we've learned from this very huge amount of local work and synthesize it into more powerful global observations that can help us guide the way we manage things. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, uh, we can determine whether we've actually looked at the world up close very well. And I would mm -hmm. argue, and I think most people who do case studies would argue, the way people choose to observe the Earth close, up close in these case studies is very arbitrary. You choose a place near your university. Mm -hmm. You choose a place that's very beautiful and interesting. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily choose to sample the Earth 
in a realistic, reliable way in which looking at what we've seen, you can say something about the whole Earth. And this kind of tool would enable us to very quickly assess where are the holes in our knowledge about how we've changed the Earth locally. Hmm. So it's got three big elements that can really advance the science of understanding land change. Um, but like I said, it's just, at this point, it's just an idea mm -hmm. um, that we're, we're trying to develop into a research proposal mm -hmm. for funding. Well, thank you very much, Earl. It's been a real pleasure having you uh, describe all your research today. It's really been wonderful. Um, I'm Karen Riedel, and thank you for joining us here at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Thank you, Karen.